Now, if you have not read Greg Rucka's Queen and Country yet, I suggest that as soon as this panel is over, you get your butt downstairs to the Oni booth and hook yourself up with one of the most unique spy comics you'll encounter. There are eight volumes of this espionage series, all illustrated by different artists, as well as three novels. The protagonist is Tara Felicity Chase, named so after Rucka's high school best friend, in honor of discovering a love of greedy spy fiction series together. One of those was The Sandbaggers, a British Cold War era drama broadcast in the late 1970s. It's created by Ian McIntosh, a former lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy, who had an intelligence background. Sandbaggers is a nickname for the special operatives in the Secret Intelligence Service, an organization known as SIS or MI6, and essentially they're the equivalent of the American CIA. People in special operations are absolutely nothing like James Bond. And in fact, Bond is mentioned throughout the series to reinforce how much of a fantasy 007's world of espionage is compared to the real thing. One of these days, you have a special operations capability of your own. So I've come here to tell you something. Special operations doesn't mean going in with all guns blazing. It means special planning, special care. Fully briefed agents in possession of all possible alternatives. If you want James Bond, go to your library. But if you want a successful operation, sit at your desk and think. And then think again. I understand. Our battles aren't fought at the end of a parachute. They're won and lost in grand, dreary corridors in Westminster. And hopefully in Oslo. Yes. The real thing is filled with tedium, cramped offices, contention between the government and SIS, a special relationship with the CIA, one that consists of exchanging mutually beneficial, if seedy, favors. Politically and personally dangerous missions are the rarity. Most of the sandbaggers' time is spent shuffling paper from in-tray to out-tray. They are instruments of government, nothing more. What impressed Rucka about the show is that it emphasized the politics and political tension between government and espionage, something that was, and for the most part remains, lacking from Bond. Rucka says what made the sandbaggers sing for him was that the stories were always about individuals, and that you saw the toll this work takes on people's lives set against the context of the mission, the even larger context of the political situation, and how those influence one another. He found dramatic power in the idea that these people were entirely expendable, and that it was a political level that made it the most human story because it was the political level that was saying that people don't matter. And that dramatic potential, combined with character-driven stories that explore the moral complexity of global politics, make Queen and Country a spiritual sequel to the Sandbaggers. So Tara is a special operations officer for the SIS, here nicknamed Minders rather than Sandbaggers. And like its inspiration, Queen and Country is set in the real world and takes an honest look at modern espionage, from sending agents on politically sensitive and often dubious tasks, such as government-sanctioned assassination, to the subsequent necessary paperwork. Tara's is a thankless job, one marked, as her boss says, by months of tedium interrupted by bursts of bowel-freeing panic. <laughs> like James Bond, particularly Daniel Craig's most recent incarnation, Tara is as uh, 007 Superior describes him, a blunt object, but she's also smart, very smart, and skilled, and as Rucka noted, unlike Bond, Tara feels fear, an emotion that humanizes her without making her vulnerable, and further grounds the series in reality. Regardless, she's also incredibly damaged, understandable, considering one day she's asked by her government to assassinate someone, and the next, handed over to a foreign government by her own people to appease the very act that they had sent her to do. Yep. She goes to work knowing she's good at her job, better than most, and is still entirely expendable. She does it for queen and country, and as Gail Simone said, I think she's ruined me for other spies. Um, and so I just want to uh, run, um, run back through the questions really quick. Uh, so that we have time for Q&A. Um, so the questions that I asked at the beginning were, what does it look like when women fill traditionally male archetypes? Um, is it just a gimmick? Uh, or do they challenge uh, gender assumptions? 
Uh, and I think that we are just going to go through to the end so that we can start chatting with each other. Oh, and before we do, um, I want to I wanna bring someone out uh, because my husband found her for me on the exhibition floor yesterday. <laughs> and I think that she should join the conversation. Um, here's Miss Honey West. So we'll just we'll just set her right there. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I don't know how aware you are of this, but. Um, when you said at the very beginning to think of your archetypal spy agent, um, I went to COVID Affairs, which mm. is a new show that came out on USA this summer and also under covers. Mm. What do you think of COVID Affairs' take on the female agent? Me, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it. Well, wrong. yeah, you know, so I only watched the first few episodes, and it was it was kind of like a refried Sydney Bristow, and I'm such a fan of Sydney Bristow. Um, that it's one of those things that I think I would probably enjoy it more if I sat and went through this, the whole series instead of going from week to week. Um, and uh, Undercovers, I really enjoyed a lot. And I was really bummed that it was canceled. I mean, what did you think of them? I didn't get to see it. I just knew it existed. Oh, yeah. It was on at the wrong time. Gotcha. And now it's dead, which is sad. Yes. Um, this is for uh, Trina and Cynthia. When you adapt the um, Honey West for comics, what are some of the challenges you face as you um, try and gear that series for today's audience? Um, well, you know, I wasn't thinking in terms of gearing for today's audience. It's very retro. My story takes place in 1965 and 1966 because that's when the TV series took place. And um, this one, the one that Cynthia has drawn, and the next one that's coming out, and the one, there's yet another coming out after that that I haven't started writing yet, all take place in either 65 or 66. So, you know, I don't like the idea of modernizing things, to be honest. I mean, if I had my way, Wonder Woman would still be happening in the 40s. <laughs> but Cynthia, talk about the art. Well, I've done a lot of uh, work with Trina. We've done several, many projects together. And this script was very different. I mean, right off the bat, there was very, very clearly retro um, sexuality going on. Things were sexy, but not salacious, you know? And uh, it took me by surprise, but it was a very easy vibe to get into. You know, I could show the prettiness and the beauty of Honey West without, you know, look, drawing her for an, in an exploitative way. You know, I loved doing the fashions, and it was very clearly... Um, a, she was bringing some changes on some, some 60s attitudes towards women and stuff and, and doing some subversive things with that, but it was just a lot of fun. It was just supposed to be fun, you know, and lighthearted and stuff, so I tried to make the art reflect that. Okay. Quick follow-up question. A lot of lovely different covers on that series. What, what is your view of the perfect cover for a Honey West? Album? Something that I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love the painting covers. Um, I think that something that... Um, you know, sepia, black and white, you know, that showed Anne Francis in a classic pose from the, the movie, I mean, from the television series, would be fantastic. She was unbelievably beautiful. And uh, something with, you know, animal fur. That was another weird thing yeah, that we were yeah. doing. You know, we're both very pro-animal rights and stuff like that. But as Trina often says, they'd be dead by now anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that the... The three heroines that I showed in the beginning were all wearing leopard print. Yeah. It was leopard a big skin. thing. And I liked showing the contrast between her leopard skins and, uh, and Bruce, Bruce yeah. the ocelot, you know, and there was all different patterns that we could get and in there. But something black and white and very artsy that showed different types of animal skins, you know, and made into a uh, cool 60s clothes. That in, would be my ideal. In cover. the 60s series, she also wore a lot of animal skin. Yeah, I got, print. See, Faux, I got to see. I'm sure it was faux leopard. No. <laughs> I got to, Trina sent me a DVD of the series, you know, and, and there's just that great 60s black and white cinematography. So I kind of drew it as though it were to be printed in black and white, and then we got this fantastic colorist named Mark Simmons to come in, and he did an incredible job. He got special mention in a lot of reviews. So. Yes? Actually, this question's for you. So when you're talking about Senior Reveal, you want to mention Read, 
Um, it's interesting about Fiction House. They not only hired more women uh, cartoonists during the war, but they had actually had the strongest female heroines, and they were not, none of them were superheroines. They were all, they were girl reporters, they were aviatrixes, they were spies, um, all sorts of other things. Of course, you had your jungle girls, too, naturally. Um, I did say girl detectives, right? Oh, girl reporters. But they had, they just had so many strong female characters. Now, there was a writer, one of their writers, they had a number of writers, but one of them was a woman named Ruth Roche. Um, but I, I don't think that it was just because one of the women was a writer, one of the writers was a woman. I think that there was, there was some kind of a vibe going on in Fiction House where they had women working for them, they had strong women characters, and they had these really, really good women artists of whom the best actually was Lily Renee. Yeah. Um, the fact is that when they started in the 40s during the war, their audience, a lot of their audience was GIs. Um, you know, when you're, you know, overseas, when you're in the middle of combat, you're not going to want to stop and read a novel. So a lot of GIs read comics. Comics were really, really big during the Second World War because they were read by the soldiers. But this was something that also did appeal to little girls. I don't think it was necessarily... You know, they didn't on purpose say, let's do a comic for little girls. But if you read their letter columns, they used to have letter pages, you'll see that at least two-thirds of the letters, maybe not two-thirds, maybe I, I think roughly half are, are by female readers. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, as far as I understand, uh, during World War II, the biggest audience for comics was actually overseas. Singers. Yes, it was. I just had a question, um, I guess kind of ripping off of Jennifer's um, provocative, obviously, uh, uh, suggestions for how to think about, about what, these, what these female figures are saying about, about archetypes that are usually seen as masculine. I guess when, when I see these um, uh, characters like uh, Miss, uh, like, like Senorita Rio and these other things and the, and the, the use of fashion, I'm reminded very much of uh, Blondie, for example, which was uh, a, a strip that featured her and her fashion. Uh, George, George McManus is bringing a father, the same thing. The whole idea of creating the latest fashion, you know, uh, uh, upper class fashion, and things like that during the 30s and 40s. I guess I'm wondering how different these things really were, especially if they were being read by men who I imagine, you know, were also thinking of pinups, uh, of Betty Grable and stuff like that, for, for sexual, you know, stimulation, let's, let's face it. So I'm just kind of wondering where you all might fall upon that. I mean, it's been kind of a two-edged sword. Um, I never thought of fashion as a two-edged sword. I mean, one thing is that all of them are more clothed than today's superheroines. You know, obviously, um, today's superheroines have a blatant sexuality, much more blatant yes, those than those for sexual stimulation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think also that it was a short shorthand for sophistication. You see what I mean? If this woman is wearing the cutting edge of 40s fashion, 